ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته <تصفيق> Firstly, it's my pleasure to be back here with you guys again. Um, not on the most joyous of occasions that we are talking about tonight. Um, and I was thinking of many things to talk about on the way here to get you to help this project. You know, I, I've learned something when it comes to business. I'm a, I'm a businessman by nature. This is what I've been doing for a long time. Da'wah is not my business there's no business in this this is a way of life my businesses i run businesses martial arts schools retail businesses and one thing i've learned is that people are very reluctant to let go of money unless there is some emotional reason to do so this is just reality this is the human nature i, I studied psychology in in my secular studies and I've learned in business that if you want people to pay for something, get them emotionally attached to it. As soon as they're emotionally involved, they will open up the wallets and empty it out. Even if they regret it later on. You'll have a lot of people, if you're really good at sailing, what I've learned is if you're really good at sailing, then you will have people who will come back regretting it, trying to get their money back the next day. Then you're good at what you do because you're able to convince them. Normally Muslims, we don't try to come and get our money back. So if I can get you emotionally involved, then I could get you to fundraise. But I hope the brother after me will do that because what I want to do is try to get us to understand what is sometimes not understandable. Get us to comprehend what is not comprehensible. Because when we look at the world today, as the brother was beautifully saying before me, it's, for Muslims, it's chaotic. For a lot of the Non-Muslims, it's chaotic. But for Muslims, in sure, the world right now is chaotic. We are, as he said, trampled on. We are in horrible conditions, no matter where we are. In the West, we have a bit, more than a bit of luxury compared to what a lot of the Ummah is going through. And a lot of the questions I keep hearing from Muslims uh, is, why is all of this happening to us? Why is all of this happening? The brother spoke very... Clearly that it's a lot of it has to do with us, our divisions and, and things of this nature. But I also want us to take a step back for a moment. Muslims are very good at pinpointing scenarios and becoming tunnel visioned. Into looking at only what's happening in the here and now. Not being able to take a step back for a moment and look at the big picture. This was something the Prophet ﷺ was, was able to do. He was able to step back and look at the bigger picture. Sometimes based on wahi that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes based on the own uh, hikmah that Allah had given him and wisdom to see bigger pictures. I want to explain to you a few instances of situations where it seemed as if things were very dark. Things were very unfortunate. They looked like there might be no way out for these individuals I'm going to talk about tonight. But at the end of it all, Allah brought forward the big picture. We know very beautifully Allah says in the Quran, Makaru wa makaru Allah, that we plan and Allah plans. Our plans are always going to have some flaws to them. Why? Because we're human beings. We're flawed. Our innate nature is that we're, we're flawed. We're going to make mistakes even in our planning. And then Allah says and He plans. And Allah is the best of those who plan. So sometimes we have to understand that we can make the best of plans. As a human being, I can make the best plans for my future, for my children's future, for my family's future. We as an ummah can come together and make the best plans to move forward. Even if we found some way to find unity, we can make the best plans to move forward. But at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. And that plan is perfect because it comes from He who is perfect. And sometimes that plan doesn't even make sense to us. Sometimes our plan is not right. And so Allah interjects His plan into the scheme of things. And we can't understand it. Sometimes it looks as if things are going a mess. I'm trying my best, but it's not working. Oh, it's working. You just don't see it. 
It might be that your plan wasn't going to lead you to where you want it to be. So Allah is rerouting the, 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 the sat-nav of your life. He's rerouting you. You are about to head into a lot of traffic. And Allah is sending you another way. During the life of the Prophet ﷺ, when things became too hard in Mecca, too hard in Mecca, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to make hijrah. Allowed him to make hijrah. And we all know the very famous story. He was surrounded, his house was surrounded. He escaped without them, uh, with Allah making them blind where they couldn't see him. He walked right past them. And he left with his best friend in this life, his Khalil, Abu Bakr. And they left out of the city of Mecca. And in the morning when they had realized the Prophet ﷺ was gone, it was actually Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an was in his bed, who by the way said that was the most beautiful night sleep he had ever had in his life. They sent people to chase them down. And there was one man in particular whom they hired who was the best of those who did that, trackers. His name was Suraqa ibn Malik. And with the best of those trackers, he could track anything. So he said, I'll find him. No problem, I'll find him. So the Prophet والسلام, and Abu Bakr were on their way and they heard the horse hooves of Suraqa ibn Malik chasing them. So they retired to a small cave up on the hillside in Mecca. If any of you have been to it, you know it's, it's, a, it's a little climb. It's a little steep climb up a hill. And... They hid in a cave that was only really big enough for two people and it really didn't conceal much. If you did a little bit of investigation, you'll find the people in that cave. But this was, was it, this is all they had. And as Suraq was coming, the Prophet ﷺ made dua to Allah and Suraq's horse fell into the sand, sunk into the sand and got stuck. And Suraq realized what's happening. So he called out to Muhammad, Oh Muhammad, make dua to Allah to release my... Horse and I won't follow you anymore. I'll, 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 I'll give up my chase. So the Prophet released his horse and Suraka broke his word and started coming at them again. So he made du'as sunk in the sand again. This happened a couple times. And finally Suraka said, look, just, just make du'a that Allah gets me out of this. I'll leave and I'll also misguide anyone who comes along this way. Now the Prophet ﷺ called out to Suraka and said something that caused Suraka to think that this man's lost his mind. This man's out of control. He said, O Suraqa, how are you going to be on the day when the bracelets of Kisra are presented to you as a booty from the believers, from the Muslims? And Suraqa is shaking his head, he's rubbing his head, he's thinking, what did he just say? This guy is by himself, hiding in a cave, everybody's looking for him to kill him, he has no support, he has nothing, and he's sitting here telling me, that I'm going to be given the bracelets of one of the greatest kings on the earth right now, the greatest empires that the world has known. This man must be out of his mind. He's lost it. This is when he thought, he just said that this guy's nuts. And he, he, they, just, they just couldn't realize what happened. But then the rest of the Meccans came and they started to approach the cave where the Prophet is. And as they got close, Abu Bakr became frightened. Abu Bakr is human nature kicked in because it looks like this plan is not working. Abu Bakr is thinking to himself, his human mind, his nature is saying, Ya Rasulullah, I love you to death, but this plan this doesn't look right. They're going to see us. Even if they look down at their feet, they're going to see us. And the Prophet والسلام, asked Abu Bakr, he said, Oh Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, what do you think of two people whom the third of them is Allah? What do you think is going to be the outcome of two people whom the third of them is Allah, subhanAllah? And then he said something to him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguards for us in his book. He said to him, لا تحزن إن الله معنا Do not worry. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. Have no concern. For Allah is with us. And of course we know the story that the Meccans didn't see them. And they were able to continue the hijrah and build an empire that would indeed surround the world. The civilized world at one time. Later on, after the Prophet's death, Suraqa, uh, before the Prophet's death, Suraqa would become a Muslim. He would enter into Islam. Then Abu Bakr's Khalafa came. It was struggle. They were fighting different uh, elements within the Ummah. The people who uh, apostated from Islam. The people who refused to pay zakah. A lot of things happened. Then the Khalafa of Umar came. And Umar was able to conquer the Persian Empire. 
and the bounty came into the Khilafah. And as Umar was going through it and distributing it, a box was brought to him and he opened it up. And in it was the bracelets of Qisra. So immediately, he said, bring for me Suraqah. Tell Suraqah to come to me. Tell Suraqah to come. And Suraqah came and Umar presented to him the bracelets of Qisra, saying that this is the fulfillment of the promise of Rasul to you. And Suraka began to cry, remembering his past, remembering he was what he was once doing. And now look at this Ummah. The Ummah was so affluent that the braces of Kisra are sitting right in front of Suraka, and he made him put him on. You see, Suraka couldn't understand what the Prophet was talking about. Abu Bakr couldn't even really see what was really happening. But the plan of Allah was in full motion. Was in full motion. Sometimes we can't see it. Sometimes it, it, it doesn't seem like it's working. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. Let me tell you about another man named Dawood alayhi salam. We all know Dawood. There was a woman at his time. There was a woman at his time who used to do knitting. And she used to take that knitting every day to the market and sell it. And get food enough to feed her children for that day. One day she was on the way to the market and a bird came and swooped and took her knitting. She had nothing left to feed her children. So she went into Dawood salam, and she confronted him and she asked him, is Allah just or is Allah unjust? Is Allah just or is Allah unjust? And Dawood is thinking, what, what kind of question is this? And he told her, she told him what had happened, that I feed my children every day off the knitting that I make and that's all I have. Today a bird... A bird who was acting off of his fitrah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came and took this knitting and took it away. Now I have nothing to feed my children. So is Allah just or is he unjust? As she was saying this, some men came in with huge bags of gold. And they dropped it in front of Dawood alayhi salam and they were foreigners, they weren't known. And, the, and they said to Dawood, this is for you, for the sake of Allah, a sadaqah to whomever you think it should be distributed to. And Dawood is asking them, what, what, what's, what's the story here? You know, there's got to gotta be a story behind this. Why are you here with this large amount of money? They said that we are merchants by trade and we were traveling across the sea. And a huge storm came and broke the sail on our ship and we were just being tossed about in the ocean. So we made dua to Allah that if He gets us out of this predicament, then we will don't aim everything on this ship for the sake of Him alone. At that moment, a bird came and dropped some yarn and materials and knitting that we were able to use to reconstruct our sail that brought us safely here to you. So here we are fulfilling our oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dawood alayhi salam looked at the woman and he asked her, is Allah just or is Allah unjust? You have a Rabb who is working for you on land and on sea. Is Allah just or is He unjust? And He gave it all to her. You see, sometimes the plan of Allah doesn't seem to be working. Sometimes it seems as if everything's against us. Sometimes we may even question the plan of Allah. Like, Ya Allah, what, why me? What are you doing to me? What, what have I done to deserve this? What has this Ummah done to deserve the travesty and the tragedy that is going through right now? This is what we ask many times and I know we've all become susceptible to it at some point in life. Let me tell you the story about another man. and I'm, That'll be it and we'll, we'll get to the point of some current issues. There was a man during the time of our Salaf named Abu Bakr al-Ansari rahimahullah alayhi alay. His, he was also known as Qadi al-Maristan. He was known as a very pious man of Mecca. He was known for his taqwa. He was a man who feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a man who tried to always distance himself between uh, uh, himself and Allah's anger. This is what taqwa means, to place a barrier between yourself and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day he was out in the streets of Mecca and he's telling his own story of his life. He said, one day I was in the streets of Mecca. I was hungry and I was looking for some food. Had, he had nothing. It was poor, mesquite. And he said, I found a bag with a, a very expensive pearl necklace in it. 
but it didn't belong to him. So he tied it up, took it home for safekeeping in case the owner comes. And he went back out in the streets looking for his food. Later on, he heard a man calling out that he had lost a pearl necklace and he was offering a reward, a large reward for whosoever would find it for him. So Abu Bakr came to the man. He said, look, I've found a necklace, but you need to describe it to me so I can know whether this is yours or not. He said the man described it perfectly. So he went and got, got it and gave it to him. And the man was trying to pay him the reward. But Abu Bakr was refusing because he's saying to himself I, and to the man, I did not do anything for this. I didn't earn it. I'm giving you back what belongs to you. Therefore, I do not feel right taking sustenance because of it. And you know how we are as Muslims. We argue back and forth. No, take it. No, I'm not taking it. Not taking it. Take it. No. Eventually, Abu Bakr just said no. And he walked away. He refused. I'm not taking this. No. I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep what belongs to you. Later on, Abu Bakr said that he realized that he could not longer, no longer live in Mecca. He couldn't find a way in Mecca. He couldn't find his sustenance. He couldn't find work. So he decided to get on a ship and go somewhere else. This is what Allah says. If you can't make it somewhere else, the earth is big. Go somewhere else. So he got on a ship to go somewhere else and a big storm came and crashed the ship. And many people on that ship died. He said, I was fortunately able to grab a piece of driftwood and the wind blew me and blew me and blew me to an island. And when he got to that island, he looked for the people. He couldn't find them. So he saw that there was a masjid. He went and he sat down and he began to recite the Quran. And his qira was known to be very beautiful. And the people of this island started to hear this beautiful, melodious recitation of Qur'an. They went to see who it was and they found Abu Bakr in the masjid reciting. And they said to him, you know how to recite the Qur'an beautifully. Will you teach us and our children how to do this and we will pay you and give you a place to live? He agreed and they started to pay him. He had a home and he did this for a while. And then one day he was sitting in the masjid reading some of the pages of the Qur'an that they had laying around in the masjid. And they asked him, you know how to read and write? He said, yes, I know how to read and write. None of them knew how to read and write. They said, teach us and our children how to read and write and we will increase your salary and pay you even more. So they began to increase his salary, pay him even more. And he stayed with them for a while. Then came a time where he decided, you know, I've been here long enough. I want to move on to the next position in life. Move on somewhere else. And they realized that he was going to leave. And they didn't want him to leave. So they said, we have to keep him here. So they devised a very good plan to keep him here. They said, look, let's just get him married. We get him married, he's going nowhere. So there was a girl who was known to be one of the most beautiful, pious, from the most pious family girls that had just been orphaned. She had recently been orphaned. She had no wali. So they tried to get him married to her. He refused. And again, the haggle went back and forth. Yes, no, yes, no, yes. And finally he gave in. He said, okay, I'll marry the girl. The nikah was arranged, the girl was brought in, and Abu Bakr said, as I started to look up from her feet, and up and up, and I got to her neck, and his head dropped and he began to cry. Now, the girl thought that it was because she was ugly. So she started crying, and turned away, and the people were shocked. Oh my God, this pie, you just embarrassed this girl. This is the best one we have, and you have just, you've just broken her heart. He said, it's, no, it's not because of that. He said, the reason I'm crying is because on her neck is a necklace that I have recognized. I found this necklace in the streets of Mecca one day and I gave it to a man. And they started to shout, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. They said, her, the, the, her father was the owner of this necklace that you gave it to. And we used to hear him talking about this man that he met in Mecca who was one of the most pious and righteous Muslims he had ever come across in his life. And we used to hear him openly making dua to Allah for you to be married to his daughter. And here you are. And he got married to her and he had children and he became very affluent. She died, his children passed away, but he ended up selling the necklace for a very large amount of money. And he was explaining this as to how he became a very wealthy man in this place. You see, when Abu Bakr al-Ansari was being tossed about on that driftwood in the ocean, I'm sure he couldn't understand the plan of Allah. He didn't realize what was happening. Little did he know that even though he had a plan, Allah also had another plan to answer that father's dua. And 
Abu Bakr was doing nothing but being led towards that destination by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Abu Bakr had a plan and Allah had a plan. And maybe Abu Bakr didn't see it, but it came to be just the way it was meant to be. You see, that's, that's how life is sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't look like it's going right. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan. We look at what happened very recently in Mecca. Very recently in Mecca, when the crane collapsed and brought part down of Masjid al-Haram on those people who died, over a hundred people. And I've seen on social media, you know, they blame everybody in the world. You know, first of all, they blame the Saudi rulers and they blame this and they blame that. And even Saudi blames the Bin Laden company, you know what I mean, for not securing the crane. Everybody had some blame. And I'm sitting back thinking to myself, as we're complaining, I guarantee you those people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose on that day, because I've seen many of the videos, there were many people who died and the person right next to them didn't die. These people were chosen and I guarantee you not a single one of them is complaining right now. None of them are complaining. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen them and conferred a favor on them, which if any of us were smart, would wish that it could happen to us. Would beg Allah day and night that that could be an end that we could meet. Because not only did they die in the best place on this earth, Masjid al-Haram, they died on the best day to die on a Friday, which if you die on a Friday, you're saved from the trial and torment of the grave. Not only that did they die, but they died in a way upon which makes them shuhada. The Prophet ﷺ said, a wall falling on you and collapsing upon you is, sh is shaheed. And they died during the best time of the year. The best days of the year. Approaching upon them dhul hijjah. What more could you want as a human being, as a Muslim, to end your life? And it wasn't as if they suffered. They were there and then they were gone. And while their bodies were being picked up off the ground, their souls were already resting in green birds. Traveling throughout Jannah wherever you wish. And that night when their bodies were being laid to rest, they were making their homes in lamps that hang off the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every day, Allah speaks to them and asks them every day. He asks those people who are the shuhada, what do you want from me? Ask me and I will give you. Every day they respond, we don't want anything. And every day Allah asks again, what do you want from me? Ask me and I'll give you. And they respond, we don't want anything. Until finally they will realize that Allah will not stop asking unless we give Him an answer. And they all say with one voice in unison, Oh Allah, if you could give us anything that we would want, it is that you would send us back to the world that we came from and let us die the same death again and again and again and again. You see, sometimes we don't look at the big picture. We don't look at the big picture. If Saudi rulers were to blame for it, then I would be thanking them. If that was my own son, I'd be happy. My son made it. If that was my father, my father made it. I would be mad if I was, I would be frustrated if I was the one standing next to them. That I wasn't chosen. I would think there's something wrong with my iman. You see, sometimes we have to look at the big picture. That this ummah is suffering. It's suffering. Absolutely it's suffering. And we, we, we like to feel sorry for those who are suffering. We like to look at them in, in, with compassion the way that we should. But sometimes we forget that the real people who might be suffering... The real people who might be being tested the most are the ones who are going home tonight to sit on our luxurious couches with a refrigerator 10 feet away where we can go get anything we want to eat and turn on our big flat screen TVs and lay tonight in our nice, warm, comfortable beds. Maybe we're the one being tested the most. Maybe it is that Allah loves those people in Syria so much. Maybe it is Allah loves those people of Palestine so much for all that they have struggled for to keep the house of Allah and the purity of the, one of the most holy places on this earth. Maybe Allah loves them so much that He's putting them through all this hardship to only grant them the highest and highest and highest ranks of Jannah in the next. While we are sitting home on our luxurious couches, maybe dying in the middle of our sleep to only be tormented in the grave and tested on the day when we meet Allah. So who's really winning here? Yeah, gotta think about the big picture sometimes. I don't consider myself a teacher. Unless you want to learn some martial arts, like teach. What I am is I like to be a psychologist when I come and stand in front of you and teach you how to think. 
and retrain your thought process. Because one of the biggest problems with this ummah today is the way that we think. The way we think, our thought process, the way that we process information is completely different than the way the companions processed information. World events that happen and I look at social media and I look at the world and I've been on every continent except Antarctica, there's no Muslims there yet. Global warming comes and we, we will guarantee you if it can be inhabitable, we will find a way to inhabit it. This is the way the Muslims are. But I see how we respond to things. Our We've been programmed some way, somehow, our programming up here has changed the way that we don't see things though, the way that we should. The Prophet والسلام, saw things big. He saw things from the right perspective. The companion saw things through the right lens. Now we cannot see past what's right in front of us. And if it's not affecting us, we, we won't do anything but gripe and complain about it. We'll do very little. Do very little. And we will very surely, rarely turn around and wonder, what is my role in this? What is it that I'm going to be questioned about? Because every single one of us are people who will be questioned. You will have to give account for every single action of your life that you've done past the age of puberty. You're going to have to find a reason why I did such and such and such and such and such and such. It's all going to be written in your book. What about this ummah? who's living in the West in laps of luxury, even if, even if you make minimum wage compared to those people, you are living in luxury. In luxury. From seeing the stories of people who can't even feed their children and that's why they're leaving. Because their children are crying at night hungry and there's nothing to feed them. The images of this little boy washing up on the sea, washing up on the beach, breaks my heart. I'm a father, I have three children. To see that is just, it, 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 it hurts, but at the same time, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want that boy to go through whatever it is he was about to go through, so Allah took him home. No country wanted him, nobody would support him, nobody cared about him at that moment, except his parents who lost him. So Allah said, take him home. Allah took him home. So we have to ask, what are we going to be questioning? What did we do when we saw all of this happening? When we saw all of this going on, did we even make any effort? Any effort whatsoever? We have to question ourselves now. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an said, become your own hasib, your own accountant. In this life, before the next life when the account is going to be taken from you. When the account is going to be taken from you. We have to learn to reprogram the way we think as I close out. We have to learn to reprogram the way that we think we cannot change the world. Let me tell you that right now. We can't change the world. I don't care how strong we may become. We can't change the world. I don't care how much money we were able to amass. We can't change the world. I don't care how strong our fortresses and, and military became. We couldn't change the world with it. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed it to be so. It's impossible. I don't care how many protests you have. I don't care how many petitions you sign. I don't care what big group you gather. If Allah Azza wa Jal has not placed it within His plan for you to be successful, you will fail again and again and again and again and again. So if this ummah is humiliated right now, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed it to be so and it's for a reason. This is what we keep stop thinking. We keep saying the ummah is humiliated. But I, and, and when I hear that, I keep thinking, what's the reason? This ummah doesn't have unity. What's the reason? This ummah doesn't have strength. What's the reason? Got to get to the core of the problem. And the majority of it is because of what goes on right up here in the mind of every single Muslim. We've forgotten where to put our priorities. Forgotten where to put our priorities. Our priorities are skewed. I'm going to give you one last verse that you all know. You all know this verse and you've heard this verse. And you've recited this verse. And it is the plan for success. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَتَقِ اللَّهِ Whosoever fears Allah, whosoever has taqwa for Allah. And as I told you, taqwa is a barrier between you and Allah's punishment. If I were going to walk over some shards of glass right now, if there was glass all over the parking lot, I would make sure I put on shoes or sandals. This is taqwa because it would prevent me and protect me from that glass on the, on, on, on the road. Taqwa is you placing that barrier by any means necessary between you and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it means doing more good, that's taqwa. If it means staying away from evil, that's taqwa. Whatever it is that keeps you away from the punishment of Allah in Jahannam, that's considered taqwa. 
So Allah says, whoever has this taqwa for him, يَجْعَلُهُ مَخْرَاجًا Allah will make for them a way. You see, you don't have to worry about the way. You see, this is what Muslims get so caught up in, the plan, the way, what are we going to do? No, no, Allah says, don't worry about the way. You fear me and I will make the way. I'll show you the way when there is no way. I'll open a door when there wasn't a door there. I will create means for you. Like the man who killed 100 people. And Allah shrunk the earth to get him forgiveness. I wish I had the time to go through the story. There was a man who killed so many people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made angels measure something, the earth for him to see whether he was closer to one point or another. And he was closer to the point which would have gotten him punished. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shrunk the dimensions of the earth. Allah could have just made him die closer to where he was going. But no, Allah wanted to show us how he can do things. You put a little effort, Allah can change the very physics of the universe on your behalf. But we, we keep thinking that we can do it. We can, no, we can't do anything. There is no capabilities. There is no power. There is no ability except but by that which Allah gives you. You don't stand unless Allah allows you to stand. You don't breathe unless Allah allows you to breathe. You don't walk unless Allah gives you the capability to walk. And at any moment, He can take it all from you. This is what we have to learn as Muslims. That our success, our failures, our makes, our breaks, everything is reliant on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision in our life. Everything. There is nothing we can do about it except work within the parameters to do the best that we can for Allah. That's it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيُرْزُقَهُمْ and I will provide, give you risk from places you didn't even imagine it could come. Allah says, I will open doors of risk for you that you couldn't even comprehend that they could exist. Like a small band of backwards desert dwelling Arabs conquering the two greatest nations in the world within a generation. Unheard of. Allah says, he'll make a way. He'll make a way. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَتَوَقَّ عَلَى اللَّهِ And whosoever placed their trust on Allah, فَهُوَ حَسْبُ Then he becomes sufficient for them. He becomes enough for them. He becomes enough for them. I'll tell you one last final story and I'll close and hopefully I will set the scene for you to do what you need to do tonight with this brother. When the battle of the trench took place during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and 10,000 had surrounded Mecca. Over 10,000 bands and bands had surrounded Mecca. They built a trench off of the advice of Salman al Farsi. It's something he had seen done in Persian warfare. And the trench was not a trench that surrounded the whole city. If any of you have ever been to Medina and you've been to Masjid Saba, then the parking lot of Masjid Saba is where they dug that trench. It was, just, it was just a trench that was the only exposed area for them to be able to get into. The rest was all mountain and volcanic rock that you're just not gonna, you're not gonna get an army over it very easily. So they dug this trench and the Prophet ﷺ told everyone, look, get ready to defend yourself if you need to. If you're, if you're able to defend yourself, do it. And when they dug this trench, the hypocrites of Medina were thinking to themselves, Oh my goodness, this is not enough. What are you doing? This, this isn't going to work for long. There's 10,000 people over there and, and by days they can bring more and more and more. They are on us. So they ran into the Muslims and told them, Don't you know that a great army is gathered against you out there and you've dug this little trench and you think it's going to be okay? This is all you've got. This is your grand scheme and plan. We're done in order to make them fear and give up. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it only made their iman increase. See us, we'd get scared and fear and frightened. Oh, this is, yeah, you're right. This is not, we, we'd be fighting with each other. No, no, we need to give up. No, 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 it's going to work. No, it's not going to work. We need to do something else. We would be fighting while they're out. We'd probably have killed each other before they ever got into the city. Us, this ummah now. We, we would have done ourselves in arguing over it. But the companions, they are, their iman only increased. And they looked at those hypocrites and they said, Allah, wa nima Allah is sufficient for us. Yes, we know that trench is not enough. Don't you think we know that? That trench will never, they'll find a way over it. That's not enough. But Allah is sufficient. Allah is enough. And He's the best of protectors. That trench is not going to protect us. There's not enough numbers of us to protect us. But Allah is sufficient 
and he is the best of those who can protect us. And when they woke up in the morning, they found no one. No one left. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had implemented his plan, bringing his army in. You see, Allah's army isn't always dressed in fatigues and battle gear and weaponry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has things that you don't understand that work for him. The, the creation works for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sent in his army and routed them. And Allah became sufficient for them. But what caused that action to happen? What caused that plan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be into motion was their taqwa. Was their reliance and trust in Allah that Allah is enough and we know Allah is enough. And we have no doubt about that plan. This needs to be the ummah of 2015. That we don't have enough unity. We, we might not even have enough money. We might not even have enough knowledge. We might not have enough piety. But Allah is enough for us. If we can do our best to seek the pleasure of Allah in everything that we do, then I have no doubt, no doubt, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will move mountains on our behalf. No, no doubt whatsoever in my mind. Because Allah says, Qad aflaha al mu'minun That these believers are successful. They are successful. That's a guarantee from Allah. Whether you decide to believe in that and live like that or not, it's up to you. Allah has already made it cemented, firm in His word that you are successful. We need to wake up. We need to stop living like we are the most humiliated people on the earth. We need to stop believing that. We need to stop giving in to that. That you should be ashamed of who you are. That you should be afraid of who you are. That you should be hiding who you are. That you should feel downtrodden. That you should have that frown on your face every day. That you should be worried about them knocking on your door every day. Stop believing that hype. Because at the end of the day, we know that I, I, me, I believe. Therefore, whatever happens to me, is part of Allah's beautiful, wise plan. And the only thing I'm going to do is trust in Him who planned it and try to worship, worship Him to the best of my abilities and do good when the opportunity presents itself and try to stay away from evil when that opportunity presents itself. That's all you need to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take care of the rest. You have an opportunity tonight. I know the brother's going to come up and he's going to do some stuff and he asked if I could help when it got a little bit low. But... I'm not going to even give him the chance to let it get a little bit low. We're going to do what he needs to do tonight. This brother, when he comes up, we're going to do what he needs to do tonight. And I've taken a little bit longer because I want to make his job easy. I want to make his job easy tonight. You have a chance tonight to be like one of two people. One of two people. There was two companions of the Prophet ﷺ. One of them, can't really call him a companion, but there was two people at the time of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And after I say this, if he's not able to easily do his job, then I, I, I can't do anything more. I've done my best. There was a orphan at the time of the Prophet who had some property and he wanted to build a wall on his property. But there was a tree that was blocking his wall. And this tree belonged to his neighbor, whose name was Abu Lubaba. He went to Abu Lubaba and he asked him, could he have that tree to put it on his property? And Abu Lubaba refused. He asked him to sell it to him so that he can incorporate it into his property. Abu Lubaba refused and said, you're not getting that tree. So the orphan went and complained to the Prophet ﷺ. And he called Abu Lubaba straight away. This is a man, Prophet ﷺ at this time had so many things going on, so many things to deal with. But it shows you the love he had for not only the orphans, but for those who really couldn't have anybody else to defend themselves, he was their defender. He was their protector. So he called Abu Lubaba in and he said, Yeah, Abu Lubaba, give this orphan the tree, man. What, what is this? Give him that tree. He said, No. He said, Look, sell it to him. Name your price. The Prophet ﷺ could have been asked a ridiculous price and I'm sure he would have found a way to come up with you to fundraise for that tree. And Abu Lubaba said, It's not for sale. NFS. Read my lips. Not for sale. So the Prophet ﷺ thought for a moment, he said, I'm going to offer you a golden deal. Golden deal. What if I tell you, I will promise you a tree in Jannah for that tree. You give that orphan that tree and I promise you, you'll have a tree in Jannah. Do you know what trees in Jannah are like? <laughs> They're not like these trees out here. Their trunks are made of gold and silver. Their leaves are softer than silk and the fruit that comes off of them is softer than butter and it's sweeter than honey. And if you have a tree in Jannah, guess what that means? What does that indicate? You'll be in Jannah. 
There's, there's no one that's going to be a Jahannam forever in eternity, looking across the expanse between Jannah and, and Jahannam, saying to their mates in, in, in hell, you see that tree way, way over there? That's my tree. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. If you have a tree in Jannah, this signifies you will be in Jannah. So the man is being offered paradise for a tree. For any of us, you can have all, I'll go get you 20 trees. Now, right now. Guess what Abu Lubaba said? Nope, keep your tree and I'll keep my tree. He started to walk away, so the Prophet ﷺ was very sad because the orphan began to cry. And that pained the Prophet ﷺ. There was another companion that was sitting around watching this, and his name was Abu Dahda. Anh. This is the other person in the story. Abu Lubaba is the first, Abu Dahda is the second. Abu Dahda owned a property in Medina that was famously known. Huge orchard of all, many of these trees, hundreds and hundreds of these trees in his house. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, is this deal transferable? Meaning, if I can get that tree from Abu Lubab and give it to that orphan, can I get that tree? And you see, this is how the companions thought. This is what I'm trying to explain to you. They thought differently. He saw an opening, even if it was a slight crack, and he jumped on it. He jumped on it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, yeah, that deal is transferable. If you can get that tree, you can have that tree in Jannah. So he went to Abu, Dah uh, Abu Lubab. He said, hold on, Abu Lubab. Let me... Let me holler at you for a minute. Some business here. He said, have you heard of my garden? Have you heard of my orchard? And Abu Lubaba said, of course. There's not a person who lives in the city who hasn't heard of your orchard. I mean, are you mocking me? You know, I got, I'm, I'm fighting over one tree and you got hundreds of them. And you know what? And? And what? He said, what if I told you? And, and Abu Dahda could have bartered. He could have said, I'll give you five trees for that one tree. Ten, fifteen, twenty, fifty, a hundred. Until he gave in. But the believer... When they see something on the line like what was on the line right there, but there's no, there's no time for that. Abu Dahda was not going to take any chance that this conversation ended before he got a yes or no from this guy. So he did what he could do by going all in. He said, what if I'll give it all to you for that tree? Give you everything, the house, the trees, everything, the property, everything that's in it. You can have all of it for that tree. And Abu Lubaba is shocked. What? You must be out of your mind. Are you serious? Abu Dahda said, I'm dead serious. Shake my hand, it's yours. So Abu Lubaba said, look, everybody around, look, look, witnesses here. Abu Dahda has offered me his entire orchard and his property for this tree, and I am accepting the offer. They shook on it, done deal. Now Abu Lubaba has this beautiful home, orchard, everything. Abu Dahda, he only owns one tree now. That's all he possesses in his life. And he turns to the orphan and he says, it's yours. Now he owns nothing. 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 But he has to go home now and tell his wife and children that they're homeless. He didn't text her, you know, it's okay if I give away everything we own. He didn't confer with her, you know, can I, can I put us on the streets? No. And for what? A tree in Jannah. And guess whose tree it is? That's Abu Dahda's tree. That's not his wife's tree. She has to make her own way to Jannah. If she makes it, yeah, no problem though. She had, but for now, that's his tree. See, there's some certain things that Muslims are allowed to be selfish about. Jannah is one of them. Look, you want to come with me? I'm going. If not, hey. So he goes home and he stands outside of his property on the other side of the wall. Abu Dahda wasn't a nut job either. He wasn't, he wasn't going to go face to face with his wife. <laughs> I don't know if you brothers went home tonight and told your wife, look, we gave her everything. We're sleeping in the streets of Birmingham tonight. Pots and pans come flying, you know what I mean? So he stood on the other side of the wall and he called out, Ya Um Dahda, come out. Listen to what he said. He said what is translated as I have sold this property. I have made a transaction for this property. He didn't say I gave it away and I donated it. No, I made a transaction. You see, this is the way the companions thought. That business with Allah was business. It was business with Allah. Oh, you who believe, can I guide you to a business transaction that will avoid you a painful punishment? See, they saw it as business, real business. This was, this was man business. So she called out and she said, Oh, Abu Dahda, beautiful. What did you get for it? It's worth a lot of money. He said, I, I received a tree in paradise. Now, <laughs> brothers, like I said, if you went home and said this tonight, I don't know what would happen. But this woman was a woman who thought properly. She understood what just happened. 
She called back and she said, Oh, Abu Dahda, what a profitable trade. What a profitable. She wasn't angry. She understood her husband just did something that guaranteed him a ticket to Jannah. She couldn't be happier. She went and she got her children and started taking the sticks and rocks and dates out of their pockets. And she said, let's go for this does not belong to us anymore. She didn't say it belonged to Abu Lubaba. She said, this belongs to Allah. This belongs to Allah now. And they left. So let me tell you something. On the day of Qiyamah, Abu Lubaba was also found to be one of the hypocrites <coughs> later on. He would be known as to be one of the munafiqeen. On the day of judgment, even if hypothetically Abu Lubaba died as a believer, he would still regret that tree. He would regret that day. Seriously regret that tree on the day of Qiyamah. And he'll still regret it. But Abu Dahda won't regret any of those trees he lost. Nothing. If, if anything, he wish he could come back and give them again and again and again and again and again. So you have a choice tonight. You can be like Abu Lubaba, who was within his rights to keep what belonged to his. He didn't have to give it up. He didn't have to. You don't have to give anything tonight. Nobody is forcing you. You can keep it and go home with it. It belongs to you. Or you can become like Abu Dahda and realize the opportunity that is being presented to you tonight. Because when anyone asks you to give for the sake of Allah, see it as an imitation from the Lord of all creation. It's not me asking or this brother asking. This is Allah asking from you. And Allah says in the Quran, who is it that will lend to Allah a goodly loan? One of the companions said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, is Allah asking us for a loan? He said, Yes, Allah is asking you for a loan. So see it tonight as an invitation from the Creator of the heavens and the earth for you to do something good for yourself and in turn benefit someone else. Decide who you're going to be tonight. Jazakallah khair and barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhum.